Welcome back to Module 2 of Cyber Aces. This is our module on networking. This is Session 6, we are, where we are going to focus on Layer 4, the transport layer. As mentioned, this is the networking module. There are two other modules full of tutorials available at cyberaces.org. As we discussed previously, there are seven layers in the OSI model. Currently, we are going to be discussing Layer 4, the transport layer. The transport layer is going to ensure that we have reliable communication between hosts and services. If there are missing packets, this layer and the protocols on this layer will retransmit those packets. Or if packets arrive out of order for some reason, the packets will be reordered to uh, be properly processed by the remote service. Uh, the two most common protocols at this layer are TCP, the Transport Control Protocol, and UDP, the User Datagram, Datagram Protocol. We're going to talk about each of these in just a little bit. On Layer 4, we also have the concept of ports. Both UDP and TCP use ports. We have up to 65,536 TCP ports and the same number of UDP ports. And of course, because computers count from zero, this is actually going to be a two byte field. We're going to have zero through 65535. On our server, we're going to have services listening on specific ports. Some services are going to be very common to a specific port. In fact, many ports are semi-defined uh, by the port they listen on. Whereas when our client connects to the server, it's going to use what we call an ephemeral port. This is a high numbered uh, port that is only used for this sort of outbound connection. These, these ephemeral, I'm going to connect from my browser to a web server. The web server is going to be listening on probably port 80 or port 443. And my host is going to establish that connection using one of these ephemeral ports, these high numbered ports on the, the browser side. Our port numbers, uh, many of these are semi assigned. And I say semi assigned because there's no sort of law that says you have to run a web server on port 80. But our ports 1 through 1023 are known as the well-known ports. This is going to contain services that are going to be, you know, have been around for a while. Older type services. Uh, things like uh, HTTP and HTTPS and Telnet and SSH and DNS. On these ports, uh, on a Linux system, you cannot listen on these ports by default unless you are uh, root, you have priv uh, additional privileges on that system. Ports 1024 through 49151 are known as registered ports. These are ports that can still be registered. Now, I don't think anyone's really going through the registration process anymore. People just use ports for whatever the heck they want to because you can. Uh, but we've got a number of very commonly used services here. Things like uh, the remote desktop protocol on 3389 and things like VNC on port 5900. Ports 49152 to, through 65535 are known as the ephemeral ports. We talked about the ephemeral ports before. These are the ports that we're going to use, our, our computer is going to select when we establish an outbound connection. So for example, as we mentioned, when my browser wants to connect to the web server, the web server is likely to be listening on port 80 or 443, but we're going to use one of these ephemeral ports, these high numbered ports to establish that connection on our browser side. Here are some important ports to know. So these ports are some very commonly used ports uh, inside and outside your organization. So you'll see some of these on the internet and you'll definitely see a large number of these maybe inside a business or even your own home. I'm not going to of course read through those. If you want to spend some time looking through those, uh, feel free to pause here. Also don't forget we have the notes available at cyberaces.org. TCP is used 
to carry most of the communication uh, across the internet and in, internally too. Uh, the nice thing with TCP is it ensures reliable delivery. So if packets are dropped, we will then resend those packets. If they arrive out of order, they will be reassembled in the proper order. So TCP is designed for our accurate delivery. There is going to be extra overhead because we do need to establish reliability, but that of course is going to be the trade-off. With TCP, we have what are known as control bits or flags. Most everybody refers to them as flags because it saves us a couple of syllables. The flags here are used to identify different states in our connection. So the initial, if we look at the diagram here, the six bits to the left are the initial uh, bits, the ones that were defined in the RFC for TCP. So then later we added congestion, there's explicit congestion notification, and we added two more flags. Unfortunately, we don't really use those two flags very much as that is still not a widely implemented or uh, used specification. The important thing with TCP to establish our reliable communication is going to be the three-way handshake. So the reason we do this is it's going to establish sequence numbers. And we establish these sequence numbers so when we, we can know when data is missing. We can know when data arrives out of order how to reorder that data. We can also see, hey, I've sent data from point A to point B. B can now acknowledge that it received the data and now A has confirmed that the data has been delivered uh, successfully. As we can see here, there's three pieces uh, before we establish our communication, before we start sending useful data. That's what the three-way handshake. So what we have on the left is system A is going to randomly select an initial sequence number. It's then going to have, a, there's another field in the TCP header called the acknowledgement number. Now, we don't have any sort of uh, response yet from B because we are just establishing the communication, so this number is irrelevant. Uh, many TCP stacks will simply set this value to zero. Okay, so we've set, picked our initial sequence number. We are going to now set the SYN flag, short for synchronization, and send this packet to B. Assuming B receives the packet and it has a listening port, no firewalls, no drop packets, etc., it is then going to respond back. It's going to respond back with the SYN and the ACK flags. ACK is short for acknowledgement. It's going to acknowledge the sequence number that A sent plus one. It always acknowledges one more than the, the synchronization number. And that synchronization number, of course, as we mentioned, is going to be a randomly selected value, but then it will be incremented by the number of bytes sent by A. And B will always uh, acknowledge, assuming it received the data, that initial sequence number plus the number of the bytes it received plus one. When we get that that sin, we're gonna, as we mentioned, respond back with that sin ACK. So it will be the sequence number sent by A plus one, but then B is going to select its own initial sequence number. It's going to send this packet from B back to A. A then receives that packet. It will acknowledge B's sequence number plus one, and then we will establish our communication. So we've got this three-way handshake, sin, SYNAC, ACK, and then we're going to send our communication. So this is the, the previous page we showed the diagram of how this worked. Here is the text essentially of what we just described on the previous uh, page. So we're going to have this three-way handshake where remember our acknowledgement number is going to be um, one more than the sequence number plus the number of bytes sent. And then we're going to have our communication. We're going to send data back and forth. And then when one of the sides is done, they're going to exchange FIN, or short for finish, 
to terminate the connection. That is part of, that is one of the other flags that we show, we've showed you just a little while ago. Here's what the synchronization numbers look like in a packet capture. So we're going to randomly select the initial sequence number. Now what we've done here with Wireshark is it just shows us zero for the initial sequence number. It makes life a little bit easier. So we can see that our initial sin here, it's going to send a zero. Now in the next packet, we can see the acknowledgement of one because it's the initial sequence number, which we have, which is a zero, and then one more. Now then B is going to select its own initial sequence number, send it back to A, A will then acknowledge B plus one. And then we're going to send 567 bytes. B will acknowledge 568, that's because 567 plus one. We're going to have additional data sent here. The 1154 will then acknowledge 1155, again, because of the plus one. And then to tear down the connection, we're going to send a fin packet. Netstat is a command line tool we can use to look at TCP and UDP connections on our computer. So by default, it's going to show the established or active connections. If we want to show listening ports as well and listening services, we can use the dash A all to show all activity. It's going to show both the active connection as well as listening services. It's going to resolve names. If we simply want to show the IP addresses, we can use the dash N option. Now on Windows, we can use the dash O option to get the process ID that owns that specific connection. We can also use the dash B option on Windows to get the name of the process. If we want similar information on Linux, we can use the dash P option. Here's an example of us using Netstat on Windows. We're using the N to not resolve names, the O to get the process ID, and the B to get the name of the binary. At least that's how I remember it. So I would encourage you on your Windows VM, run this command and take a quick peek and you can see where your computer is talking to and then the, the process IDs and the process names that are establishing or listening for the connections. Time for some review questions. The three packets in order responsible for establishing a TCP connection are, we've got our options there. Question two, valid TCP ports are within the range and we've got uh, the list there. Pause here before you go forward, think about the answers. Question one, the three packets in order responsible for uh, establishing a TCP connection SYN, SYNAC, and ACK. That is our three-way handshake. Question two, valid TCP ports are in the range of zero through 65535. Uh, you know, technically I would have answered the, accepted the answer one through 65535 since we're not supposed to uh, uh, use port zero, uh, but this is two to the 16th. This is a two byte field with UDP and TCP. Speaking of UDP, let's talk about UDP now. UDP operates at the same level, layer four, as TCP. Now, UDP is different from TCP. It still has ports, but it is not considered reliable communication. The reason is we don't have that three-way handshake. Um, there's no sequence numbers. Uh, there's no sort of uh, retransmission or congestion avoidance. If system B does not receive a packet from system A, system A does not know. Now we could at a higher level, the application could say it's missing packets, but there's nothing built into layer four for this reliable communication with UDP. Now the reason we might want UDP is where speed is absolutely important and latency doesn't matter. So for example, this would be great for like audio or video streaming, where I need that audio right now and 
I don't care. I don't want it if, it, if it's not going to be here right now. Think of a phone call. Latency is super important. I can tolerate a little bit of garbling, but I absolutely cannot tolerate a significant lag. Other things that you'll think of is it's a single connection back and forth. Things like DNS requests, single packet out, single packet in response, where it's obvious if I don't get the response. Time for some more review questions. Which of the following is not a good application for the UDP protocol? Uh, watching videos on YouTube, listening to live broadcasts from Security Weekly podcasts, single packet in, single packet applications like DNS, query and response, or managing a server over SSH. Second question, select the following statement that is true. Transferring data over UDP is more reliable than TCP. Transferring data over UDP is less reliable than TCP. Transferring data over UDP has the same reliability as TCP. Or D, it is inappropriate to compare the reliability of UDP and TCP regarding data transfer. Think about those. Feel free to pause here and move on to the next page when you are ready. Question one, which of the following is not a good application for the UDP protocol? Managing a server over SSH. SSH requires a reliable connection, which is much more well suited to TCP. Now, that said, there is a, uh, a tool called Mosh where you can establish uh, UDP uh, similar to, to, to SSH, but then at the application layer, it handles the the, the retransmission of, of packets. But realistically, the answer here is going to be TCP. Select the following statement that is true. Of course, transferring data over UDP is less reliable than TCP. With TCP, we have the three-way handshake. We know if data has not arrived, we can reorder it uh, at layer four. If it does arrive out of order with TCP, UDP simply does not have any of those features. We've got a couple of uh, hack and defend for you. We've got some, if you take a look at the note, a couple of articles for you to read. Uh, the first is related to T TCP sequence prediction, uh, and you'll learn why it's important to use random sequence numbers. And then layer three and layer four protection mechanisms. Again, check out the notes for that information. This completes our module two, our networking layer discussing layer three. This was uh, session six, layer four. Next time, we are going to discuss layer five, the session layer, and layer six, the presentation layer. Until next time.